Okay. Well, thanks. I'm excited to be here. Um, we're going to talk about voice today. And the first problem is, what does that mean? You hear it a lot. You'll have an editor say, you know, the voice of this just doesn't work for me. Or I really like that author's voice. Or then you've got character voices. And how does that work? And how does that tie in? So let's start with what is voice. And I think in general, voice is like the personality of your writing. If you've, like, like back in my time, if I looked at uh, musicians and bands and that kind of thing, like maybe uh, like Rush, okay? Rush was a band that I really liked, yeah. And if a new Rush song would come out, I would hear that song and know right away that was a Rush song, okay? Or Styx or Queen or uh, The Cars, you know, uh, Super Tramp. These were all voices that I could hear. It's the same thing in your writing. You can have an author that you really love, and they write a book that is totally different than the other stuff they've written, but you still read that voice and go, okay, yeah, I recognize this author. So in general, voice is the personality of your writing. Now the problem is, where does it come from? How do you get it? What if you don't have a voice? So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about how to come up with voice, how to find voice. Is it, is it discovered? Is it created? Is it copied? Different things that you can do. So let's jump in. By the way, just to let you know, I did have a couple of different authors ask to be part of this. And I said, nope, this is, I'm just doing this myself. So they were really kind of disappointed in looking at the PowerPoint. So I just want you to be aware of that as we go forward. Um, all right. So your voice is how you write the flow of the story, the rhythm of the story that, that was kind of weird. Okay. Um, the vocabulary, the humor, the language, the style, what you're looking for is something that is unique to you. So that is your voice. That is the author voice that you write in. That's what you're kind of working on discovering right now. Now, there's another voice, though, and that is the character voice. And one of the things that you're going to find in character voice is that every character has to find their unique voice. How many of you guys have watched, like, say, Big Bang Theory or a, a, a series that's been running for a while, maybe Star Trek or, or something like that? Okay, if you go back and you look at the first episode of that series, having watched it for a while, one of the things that you're going to discover is that the characters aren't quite who they became. They hadn't found their voices yet, both the writers themselves who were writing it and the characters who were playing them. So one of the things I get asked a lot is, okay, well, you know, you write middle grade, so how do you write like a sixth grade boy's voice? Okay? You don't. That's the answer right now. You don't. You guys are pretty much all teens in here, right? So if I lumped you guys all together and said, well, how do you write a teenage voice? Wouldn't that kind of offend you? <laughs> All right? That's the same thing with your characters. If you try to write a sixth grade boy, or if you try to write a 17-year-old girl, or an 80-year-old man, you can't. What you can do is discover that individual character's voice. Every one of, a, of your characters, if they're real and if they're strong, they see the world through a prism. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But essentially what I mean by a prism is your history, your experiences, your education, your vocabulary. As I am sitting here and presenting to you, you're all hearing the exact same words. You're all seeing the same PowerPoint presentation. And yet all of you are going to come back getting different things out of this class based on what you were looking for, what you expected, what you've done in the past. So we've got great, A, your character voice, which is kind of your flow, your personality of your books and your writing, and B, this voice of this character. So how does that all come together? Well, let's start out first of all by saying when you are writing a book, you're going to have to choose. Do I have one protagonist? Do I have two? Do I have three? If you're George R.R. R. Martin, you've got like 78, and every new chapter is a different protagonist. Um, how many of you think in Harry Potter that there are five or more protagonists? Okay. Three or more? One? The correct answer? And you guys are all, uh, uh, I'm not sure. There's one. Okay. Harry Potter is the protagonist. How do you know that? Because Harry has a camera on his shoulder in the story. Okay, I know you don't see that camera, 
But unless Harry is there with his camera, unless it's like a prologue or something, you will never see that scene. You will never see what happens unless Harry is here to experience it. He is the main character. Underneath are major characters that play different roles. Hermione's role, she's there so that when they get stuck, she can say, well, on page 372 of Care of Magical Creatures, it says that werewolves only eat humans between the hours of 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock on the third Thursday of every month. <laughs> and you know what? You believe it. If it was Harry that did that, you'd go, oh, Every time Harry gets in a situation where he gets stuck in something, suddenly he magically remembers some arcane bit of knowledge that he read. But because Her Hermione is known for doing that, you go, yeah, I totally believe that, okay? So as you look at your characters, Ron, he plays comedic sidekick and sounding board for Harry. So great. First thing you're going to have to do is how many protagonists am I going to have? Am I going to write in first person? I did that, I went here, I picked up the piece of paper. Are you going to write in third person? She looked at this, she saw that, she felt this way. Or you can go second person. There's actually a book called You that's completely written in you walk into the room. You reach down and pick up the book, which is really weird to read. But in that case, it works. So then you've got to look at, is it close? Am I going to be tying right into my, you know, am I going to be in the character's head a lot? Or am I going to be seeing it more distantly? Am I going to jump heads? What am I going to do there? I don't care. Which do you guys think is better? How many of you think that first person is the best way to write? Okay. How many of you think that third person is the best way to write? Here's the thing. You're all wrong. <laughs> okay. There is no best way to write. What there is, is the right way for your story. Okay, if you tell me I'm writing first person because I want my character to feel skin tight in my reader and I want to tie that in, great, that perfectly works. If you come back and you're saying I'm doing third person because I want to distance my main character and I want the readers to know things that are going to happen that the main character doesn't know yet, that works too. You just need to know why you're doing what you're doing. So great. I'm the author, there's some sort of narrative voice, I've got the character, the question is, can all of this be combined, or do I have to look at two completely separate things? And what I want to read is this quote, I find that when I'm at the keyboard telling a story, it's almost as if I'm acting. I'm in character improvising the performance of my story using words and syntax that one of the characters in my tale might use. All right, how many of you have ever been in a play? Okay, you start out and you get a script and your job is to take that script and to make that your own. And probably the first time you read that story, it feels way distant from you. It's just words on a page and you can't see yourself acting that. But the more you read the script, the more you start to get into character, the closer those words on the page, that character and you start to get. You start to tie in together until you finally reach that point where when you get up on stage, you are that character. So what we did is we talked about the fact that you have your own voice in the way that you write. It's not just do you use humor or not, but how do you use humor? Do you use humor to provide a break in the action? Do you use humor as kind of a view into your character's soul? How you do these different things, and then you combine it with a character, and that's how suddenly it all comes together and it all begins to work. You write like a girl, okay? One of the best compliments I ever got, I was writing the Chandra Covington mystery series where my main character is a 20-something woman. And I was at a book club where they had all read one of the Chandra Covington books. And we got to kind of the Q&A part of it, and a woman raised her hand, and she said, I don't want this to like come across as like weird or offensive, but you write like a girl. And I said, that's great. That is such an awesome compliment. Because what you're looking for is you're looking for the reader to get lost in the character and to forget. If you're female and you're writing a male character, if the reader is going, yeah, this is a woman writing that guy, I can totally tell that, you've failed. If you're, if you're a, a woman and you're writing a female character and your reader goes, yeah, okay, I can see that the author would, you know, would believe that because she's a woman and that's why she views that in that way, you've failed. When the reader completely forgets about the author and get sucked into the voice of the character in the story, that's when you've succeeded. So 
Let's take a couple of things. I'm not going to read all of this, and I'll, I'll let you know how you can get copies of the PowerPoint. But these are some pages from some books, and I want to grab an individual sentence here, or a paragraph. The sun disappears completely beyond the horizon, and the remaining luminosity shifts from dusk to twilight. The people around you are growing restless from waiting, a sea of shuffling feet, murmuring about abandoning the endeavor in search of some place warmer to pass the evening. You yourself are debating departing when it happens. Okay? This is from a book called The Night Circus. And the writing in The Night Circus is like really rich chocolate. You read like a chapter or two, and you've got to put the book down for a little bit. This is not a book where you can say, oh, yeah, I read that book in eight hours. Because the writing is so deep and rich, and the story takes its time. It's not in any rush to go through. That is a voice that's very difficult to copy. That has to be your own voice. But it works perfectly for this kind of just strange, magical story, the night circus. Does it work? In this case, I think it does. Let's take another one. Even so, I tried my best to fit in. Year after year, my eyes would scan the lunchroom like a T-1000 searching for a clique that might accept me. But even the other outcasts wanted nothing to do with me. I was too weird even for the weirdos. And girls? Talking to girls was out of the question. To me, they were like some exotic alien species, both beautiful and terrifying. Whenever I got near one of them, I invariably broke out in a cold sweat and lost the ability to speak in complete sentences. Okay? The comparison, we only have one comparison that we use there, and that's he'd scan the lunchroom like a T-1000, which we don't even know what that is. The words are very simple. We're not writing with near the depth and complexity that we had in the Night Circus, but again, it fits Ready Player One. It fits that particular story, which is about a, a computer gamer, you know, kind of a, a geek and a hacker and what happens in that story. Let's do one more here, and then I'm going to skip the next couple of ones. Okay, Colin's posture gave him no clues. He could not see his face, which was shadowed. The magician's hands were in his pockets. His shoulders slouched. The entire front of his body was a dark, featureless pane in which a few vest buttons shone darkly. Tiger eyes. Very different from either of the other two. One thing is we've got a lot of, like, there's semicolons, there's colons, there's, there's short, his hands were in his pockets. His shoulders slouched. The front of his, entire front of his body was a dark, featureless pain. Okay? This is Peter Straub, who writes in a, in a at sometimes almost incomprehensible but beautiful way. There are times when you'll read a paragraph of his writing and go, I'm not entirely sure what that meant, but it sounded so cool. These are the voices of the authors. If you go and you read other books, other things they've written, they sound that way. They have that recognition. Um, John Grisham, he writes like a lawyer. I mean, it, exactly like it, it's reading a lawyer who's a storyteller. Okay, let's take two very similar books. If I told you this is the story of a boy whose parents died, he was orphaned, he had to go live with some really mean relatives, and then someone magical came and introduced him to a whole new world and sent him on a quest. Most of you would say that was Harry Potter. But it's also James and the Giant Peach. In fact, if we change the boy to a girl, it becomes Cinderella, okay? We can go on and on with these stories of how they all tie together and how they all happen. They start in a beginning way, but how they're approached are very different. James and the Giant Peach, just the first paragraph. Look at the feel of this. Then one day, James's mother and father went to London to do some shopping, and there a terrible thing happened. Both of them suddenly got eaten up. In full daylight, mind you, and on a crowded street by an enormous angry rhinoceros which had escaped from the London Zoo. <laughs> right away, you're like, this old doll is really weird, <laughs> okay? I know it's going to be weird. And the way that he approaches it, I mean, it's just matter of fact, yeah, he was out there. And, and it wasn't even at night or anything. It was in the middle of the day and on a crowded street, which we say in parentheses, and he got eaten, they got eaten by a rhinoceros, Okay. That's the feel of that. Now, what do we know about J.K. Rowling? We know that her writing, and, and I don't want this to be sacrilegious, her writing is not that special, okay? It's not the most amazing prose you've ever read. She's amazing at world building, and she is the master 
at characters. You take some little character like Colin Creevy, okay? And in anyone else's hands, this is just a little character that showed up in a book, you know, several books on. And he walks around and he takes pictures of Harry. He's just a minor little peon. But if you've read Harry Potter, you love Colin Creevy, okay? That's what J.K. Rowling, Luna Lovegood, you know, um, Neville Longbottom, who starts out as a really minor character and raises up to become a hero. So let's take a look at her story starts out. I'm going to focus just on um, this part that starts Mrs. Dursley. Mrs. Dursley, or Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work. And Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Dudley into his high chair. That's all you will ever need to know about Mr. Dursley, Mrs. Dursley, and Dudley. I mean, isn't that true? He's humming as he puts on a boring tie. He wants everything to be the same. He doesn't want any excitement. He would love everything to be boring continually. His life would be perfect. Okay? Mrs. Dursley gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Dudley into his high chair. She's not worried about the fact that he's misbehaving and screaming and everything. She's busy gossiping. That's totally cool. And Dudley, he's screaming. Okay? That's all you need to know. She starts right away with her characters. So, now, yes? That was weird. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Yes, they have such a unique voice, and that's one thing you can do to test your characters is read some random lines of dialogue. In my Zombie Kid series, I have three characters, okay, three main characters. In the second one, we add three girls. And in hopefully in each one, I've got my main character who's kind of adventurous but a little worried and cautious. I've got Angelo, who's the brains of the group, and he's constantly analyzing and considering. In Big Bang Theory, he would be like Sheldon. And then I've got Carter, who's the one that's always cracking jokes and being kind of irreverent and looking at the world in a different way. If I read you lines of dialogue right now, in fact, I will in just a minute, you would know right away which character was which. And that's something that J.K. Rowling does very well. So, are voices created or found? I'm going to suggest to you neither. Okay? If you go out and try to make a voice, I want to sound like Neil Gaiman. I want to sound like J.K. Rowling. I want to be the next Rick Riordan. You'll fail. You don't want to be the next J.K. Rowling. You want to be the best you you can be. So the second thing is, okay, well, do I have to find my voice? How do I look for it? What I'm going to suggest is your voice, your writing voice, is like a plant that you need to grow it, feed it, nourish it, and it will sprout up. And we'll talk about some things that you can do that. The more you write, the more you start to discover your voice. That's why, again, if you look at a TV series, as you go through that series, you start to find that as you move move through, the characters find their voice. They figure out who they are. Everything starts to work. The more you write, the more you try different things, the more you'll discover your voice. Number two, the biggest piece of advice that I give to beginning writers is give yourself permission to make mistakes. Now, what does that mean? Well, number one, it means that you go out and you read a book by your favorite author. That book has probably, by the time it's found its way into the printed book you're reading, been edited ten times. By the time you take their beta readers, their editors, their managing editors, the rewrites and everything that they're doing. Number two, this isn't their first work probably. They've probably been writing, even if they haven't gotten published, even if this is their first published book, they've probably been writing long before that. So you're taking an author that you really like, which means they're probably high up on the best of the best. You're reading a work of theirs that's been edited ten times, and that isn't their first work. And then what you do is you look at what you wrote, and you go, man, I stink. Okay? You know, do you sit down at a piano and expect to play a, you know, a concerto the first time you sit down at the keyboard? Do you sit down and begin to paint and suddenly go, oh, wait, I'm not Picasso. I'm not going to paint anymore. You don't because you know that the process is learning and growing and getting better. And so what I'm going to suggest to you is try writing things that you're afraid of. In my third Far World book, Air Key, I went to my editor and I said, 
there's something that needs to happen in this book. This is kind of the keystone of the series. There's two books here, two books here. This is the middle book. And I've got to do something that seldom happens in middle grade books. And I won't tell you what it is. But if you've read the third book, you'll, you'll know what it is or if you, when you do read it. And my editor went, wow, I'm going to have to see how that works out, okay? And when I got to that point, I worried and worried and worried as I was working up to that point if, it was, if I was going to be able to pull it off. It ended up becoming the key to that story. It, in my mind, is the best part of the entire story. But it's because I took a risk. In fact, it was funny because I was having lunch later with my editor, Lisa Mangum, and the publisher, Chris Schobinger at Shadow Mountain, he hadn't finished reading the whole manuscript. And I mentioned that just in passing to Lisa. Yeah, when this happens, and Chris goes, wait, what? What, do you do? what did you do in the book? And Lisa goes, it's okay. <laughs> so take risks. Try writing in genres you haven't written before. Try writing things that you think might be too hard. Dan Wells created a main character who has all the characteristics of a serial killer in I Am Not a Serial Killer. And in that book, one of the biggest things that challenged him was, how do I take a person with serial killer characteristics and make him likable? Challenge yourself. Try writing in different styles and genre. Write with confidence. Don't go in going, I, I kind of stink. I'll, I'll give it a try, but I just, I know I'm not very good, and this book probably isn't going to be very good, because if that's how you go in, it's not going to be very good. Here's the crazy thing about authors. You've got two parts to your ego. The first part is you go, I'm going to write 100,000 words, and people are going to read those 100,000 words. In fact, not only are they going to read the 100,000 words, but they're going to pay for the chance to read my 100,000 words, okay? You can have a pretty big ego to believe that. But the second thing is your second cousin who never reads books and doesn't like the genre you write in anyway got a free book from grandma, read the first two chapters, and told you, yeah, I really didn't like it. And for the next week, you're depressed, okay? So you've got this weird personality. You've got to shake off that scary, I can't do it side of your personality, and you've got to go in with confidence, okay? Look at the kind of books that resonate with you because one thing that you'll find a lot of times is if you say, these kind of books don't interest me as much, but these kind of books really do, there's a good chance that what's happening is the voices that you're reading in those books are resonating with your internal voice. And you're going, yeah, this is kind of a kindred spirit. So look at the kinds of stories you like, the kind of writing you like, the kind of pacing that you like, and then go back and play with that a little bit. One thing that's really fun is take a paragraph from an author you really love, take that paragraph and try to rewrite it, or even a page if you want, with no voice at all. Okay, Take out all of the humor. Take out all of the the similes, take out all of the cool pacing and the way they wor use words and just try to write it as vanilla as you can. And then go back and look and say, what was the difference? What happened between this version of it and that version of it? And then take that vanilla version and write it in your own style and see how it comes out. Um, make sure your characters have opinions and that they voice them, okay? Make sure that, that they are looking at the world through a clear prism. One of the things that I would ask you about any of your main characters, and in particular your protagonist, is what does your protagonist believe about the world that's not true? Okay? When your protagonist looks at something that happens, what is it about their past that changes things? What is it about their history? If I told you that the story of Hunger Games is about a girl who had to kill 23 other kids to get everything she ever wanted, would that be accurate? Okay, true, but when she goes in, she's got to kill 23, am I right? And what she get out of it? She gets everything she ever wanted. She gets food and, you know, a nice house. That wouldn't be an interesting story. It's what's driving her, her motives, her background, her scars, the way that she views the world. When she is pulled into this lottery, which she is pulled in, okay, I know she volunteers, but we know why she volunteers and why she was pulled in. She looks at it in a completely different way than PETA. One of my favorite scenes in The Hunger Games is when PETA goes, you know what, I know I'm going to die, but I want to die on my own terms. And Katniss goes, I, I can't afford to think that way. 
we see two entirely different prisms of the world, two very strong opinions and emotions, both of which are, are noble, both of which are good, but we can see how they both see the world in different ways. And then finally, realize there is no such thing as a good voice or a bad voice. If you come back and you say, oh, well, you know, The Night Circus was a much better book because the writing was so much better than Ready Player One. No, they're just different. They're written in different ways. One of the things that you need to train yourself as an author to do is the next time you read a really popular book, a book that sold a lot, and I won't name names here, and you go, man, that book was really lame. It was totally poorly written. I could do much better than that. That's not what you want to do as an author. As an author, what you need to do is look at that book and say, what was it about this story that made it work? Unless it's written by some famous rock star person or whatever, and, and that's why it's sold, there was something about that book that resonated. A lot of people talk about Dan Brown's writing not being particularly good, but he sells a ton of books. So what you've got to do is say, well, if it's not the writing, what was it about his story that worked? Okay, great. So we talked a little bit about don't write a teenager, don't write an adult, don't write a middle grade voice. What you need to do is you need to take on the skin of the character that you're trying to write. You need to understand what drives them, what their history is, what they want, what they believe, and draw them out of the group and say, that is the character. I'm not writing a 17-year-old girl. I'm writing this 17-year-old girl. All right? Three books that I wrote, and, and again, not trying to brag because I don't even think one of them is actually here in the store. But really quickly, what I've got is I've got... <laughs> this is really pathetic. These guys, they'll do anything for a little attention. All right, Dashner, get out of here. Okay. So, The Fourth Nephite, Young Adult LDS Fiction, House of Secrets, Adult Mystery, Case File 13, Middle Grade Fantasy Monster Lovers, okay? What I want you to do is take a look at the voices that I'm using for the stories, but there's something that I want to point out to you. Okay, so this is the fourth Nephite, and I'm just going to go with the fourth voice here, or the, fourth, the third paragraph. Have you ever seen a rhinoceros up close in a zoo? It's like standing face to face with Mother Nature's version of a Sherman tank. Even though the animal is locked safely behind bars, you get the feeling that if it decided to throw all 5,000 pounds of armored muscle at that cage, nothing could stomp it from trampling you flat. Okay? This is a high school junior football player. Okay? This is a 20-something newspaper reporter. They say the human subconscious is capable of picking up hidden danger signals long before the conscious mind is aware that anything's wrong. The senses tingle, the small hairs on the back of the neck stand, etc., etc. Well, maybe I'm just not in touch with my inner cave woman, or maybe my receiver was on the fritz that day. Whatever the case, I don't remember feeling any sense of peril, no premonitions of impending doom as I reached the top of the rise, revealing the house on the hillside. Okay? little different voice. We've got now a female character instead of a male character. She's a little bit older. She looks at the world in a different way. Case file 13. What's taking so long in there? Did you fall in? Carter Benson called to the closed bathroom door. The only answer was a muffled something from the other side that he couldn't understand. Stretch out on a big red beanbag chair in his friend Nick Braithwaite's bedroom, Carter scarfed a handful of Doritos and burst into song. Stranded on the toilet bowl, what do you do if you can't reach the roll? Okay. <laughs> Again, very different voice, right? And yet, when you look at all three stories, in each case, one of my characteristics of my writing is I use humor to explore the personality of my main character. One of the ways that I draw you in and get you to relate to my protagonist is by letting you see the quirky way that they view the world, all right? That's kind of what you're looking for in your story. So the question is, if I write an epic fantasy and a Harlequin romance and a early reader, you know, um, Ramona and Beezus type of story, aren't those all going to have different voices? Yes, they will because you're writing to different audiences but you'll still have the same sensibilities, the same feel, okay? Stephen King, you can go read one of his goriest horror stories and then go read Eyes of the Dragon, which is a kid's fairy tale, fantasy, 
And you'll still recognize Stephen King in that writing. All right. So things to consider when you're doing different stories. Number one, who am I writing for? Who is my target audience? Now, I know lots of authors say they're just writing for themselves, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. For me personally, the more I can target down who is my target audience, the better it is. Now, ideally, I want lots of people. So if I read a book or write Zombie Kid for fifth grade boys, I want fifth grade girls to enjoy it and seventh grade girls and their parents and the librarian. And so I try to expand it and make it interesting enough and smart enough that everyone will read it. But I still recognize that my target audience is a fifth grader. And a fifth grader has movies and video games and all kinds of other stuff that they can be doing. And if I don't grab them with the beginning chapter and pull them right in, and if each chapter doesn't make them go, wow, I need to read a little bit more, I'm going to lose them. They just will not read it. If they're bored, they'll close it. You guys are a little bit older. If I'm writing for you, I can take a little more time. Especially if you know me as an author, you'll be a little more patient. Younger readers will not. Point of view considerations. Again, why are you writing um, first person or third person? Read your genres. Know what they're doing. Understand why you're doing it. Vocabulary issues. I'm going to tell you in general, don't worry about your vocabulary. Don't write down to younger readers. I firmly believe that if you use big words in context, the kids will be fine with that. They'll get it. When you start trying to dumb down your story, you start to lose your voice. Same thing with page length or Book length, chapter length, people are like, well, how long should a, a middle grade novel be? How long should a YA novel be? How long should an epic fantasy be? My answer is as long as your story needs to be. Write that story and then you can deal with the rest of it. Understand the conventions of your genres. If you're writing a romance and the girl and the guy don't get together at the end, you're going to have some unhappy readers. You can do it, but people are not going to be happy. Um, sentence length and structure. Again, if I'm writing for an older reader, I can have longer sentences, more compound sentences, much more dense paragraphs. When you look at my writing for middle grade, you'll see that the page has much more white space, okay? I'm breaking up my paragraphs more. I'm getting dialogue in. I'm moving action around shorter sentences so I can focus on that. There's this tricky thing that I call standing out while fitting in, and that is understand what your genre needs and then find a way to make your story Work within that genre, but approach it in a whole new way. Have any of you read Rotten Ruin? Okay, Rotten Ruin is a zombie book. Okay, and you're like, oh, yeah, I know zombie books and all that. But what Rotten Ruin did is there's a point where the brother, who is a zombie hunter, is talking to his younger brother, who's thinking about maybe becoming a zombie hunter. And he's talking about why he doesn't just go out and slaughter zombies. And he says, you know, you know that, you know, grandma died and everything like that. If she was buried, and sorry, this is a little crude, but if she was in her coffin and you were at her funeral and one of your friends came up and peed on the coffin, how would you feel about that? That's a really shocking statement. And the, the, the boy's like, I'd beat him up. And he goes, but she's dead. What does it matter? And he goes, it doesn't matter. It's grandma. And he goes, yeah, all of these zombies, these were all somebody's relative. And suddenly you look at zombies in an entirely new way. Okay, it's fitting in while standing out. You cannot and should not be writing to all readers. If you try to write a story that everyone will love, what you're going to have a story, or if you try to write a story that everyone will like, you're going to have a story that most people won't love. I'd much rather have half the people adore my story and half of them hate it than have everyone go, yeah, that was pretty good. It's like cafeteria food, you know? It's like, it's not great. But most of the time, it's not horrible. It's just kind of there. That's what you get when you try to appeal to everyone. All right. So three things, and then we'll do questions. Number one, authority. The reader needs to feel from the beginning of the story that you know where you're going, that you charge right in and... <sighs> oh, this is just awkward, guys. That's just wrong. <laughs> you don't let guys help on your class and suddenly, you know, they're just going crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh-huh. 
All right, get out of here. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know what those guys are up to. Okay, so number one, write with authority. Believe in yourself. Come in strong and, and charge into your book with full belief that it is going to work out and be great. Number two, originality. Don't start with the first thought. You start out with a story. You're like, like, what if this person did this? You know, what if, what if this kid gets on a school bus and he looks around and realizes he doesn't recognize anyone on the school bus? Okay? And you're like, well, why would that happen? Well, maybe he got on the wrong school bus. That's your first answer. Don't go with that. Well, what if, what if they were really aliens? What if this bus was like a trap and it was taken to another planet? Okay, now that's getting a little more interesting. So when you look at your story, constantly ask yourself, what if I changed it up? What if I put it in a different time? What if I put it in a different place? What if I, you know, you look at, a, at a Shannon Hale today. If someone had told you, I want you to write a story that combines superheroes, Rapunzel, and the Wild West. And oh, by the way, I want it to be in a graphic novel. <laughs> You'd be like, I don't even think you could do that. All right. But that's what comes from asking what if, what if, what if. Get that originality. Same thing in your voice, you know. If you can find a voice inside you that really feels like you, the way that Rush feels like Rush or Sticks feels like Sticks or the Cars feel like the Cars. And I know these are all bands you probably don't know. Um, do you know them all? Okay, there you go. Then you're on to something. And number three is consistency. If you're going to write a dark, edgy book, don't start with light humor. Don't do that. The way you start out your book is the way that people are going to anticipate your book is going to go. You know, if you started a meal and took a bite and it was really sweet and sugary, and then the next bite that you took was this really thick kind of meaty taste, it would throw you off. You wouldn't be happy with that. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have different characters, different feeling, different pacing. But if you're going to write an epic fantasy story, Start it as an epic fantasy story. If you're going to write a romance, give me that feel of romance early on. You've got to get us in there and then maintain it all the way through. Okay, that is the basics there. Questions? We've got about five minutes. Yep. Who are the people? Those were Frank Cole, Tyler Whitesides, and James Dashner. And I actually put them in just because they make me laugh. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. When did I first start writing? Um, if you ask my mom, when I was three years old, she walked into the kitchen and I was copying letters out of a picture book onto a piece of paper. And she's like, what are you doing? And I said, look, mom, I'm writing a book. Okay. So if you count that, that counts. Um, the thing is, I, I made up stories all the time. I wrote all the time. When my cousins and I, we used to go fishing, and if the fish weren't biting, my cousins would go, hey, we're really bored. Make up a story. And this probably should have led me to believe where my career might go. But I wanted to make up really weird stories. It's like, I don't want this to be like any other one. So I thought and I thought, and finally I came up with the story of Captain Weenie and the Little Purple Man about a superhero hot dog and a little purple man with an umbrella who was always chasing after him and stuff like that, you know? So that kind of thing happened. I'll tell you the third thing when I probably should have realized that writing was my, you know, my salvation was uh, I was in high school and I was a senior and it was about a month and a half before graduation. And my psychology professor came up to me, a teacher, and he said, hey, I just want you to know that right now you're failing this class. And if you don't pass this class, you won't graduate from high school. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, well, what do I need to do to pass the class? And he said, you need to get at least a B-plus on the final project. And this was like a big project. There were teams. They were like making films and studies and all this kind of stuff. So the night before the project was due, I'm like, man, I wonder what I should do for this project. <laughs> well, my, my teachers really liked puns, and they particularly liked Pavlov's dog. So I wrote a 15 page handwritten paper called Pavlov's Dog, a dog on good biography, which was nothing but dog and psychology puns. I got an A plus and graduated from the class. So that's how I knew I needed to be a writer. Other questions? Yes. Okay. You've got a secondary character more interesting than the main character. That actually happens a lot. Okay. 
And what you need to do is a lot of times you set up your main character as kind of this blank page. In fact, if you ever start to write a description of your book that says, Sandra is a perfectly ordinary seventh grader until, that's wrong. Okay? Why? Because you need characteristics to play off of. You need talents and flaws and scars and histories and motives, all these different things. And so if you find that your secondary character is more interesting, it's probably because you know more about that secondary character. You know, you've got to understand what's driving that main character. You've got to find the voice. You've got to find the prism. What is it that my character is seeing in the world that no one else sees? Once you get that, bam, everything clicks into place. Okay? Yes, there's a question right here. Okay, so her question was, you're writing a book, can you have one character talk in first person, write one character in first person, and the other in third person? Absolutely. In my third Chandra Covington book, um, the main character, um, Chandra, writes from first person, and then when we go to the villain, it's all done in third person to kind of distance ourselves. I wrote in third per first person from Chandra because I wanted you to really feel close to her. I wrote from third person from the villain because I wanted you to see him from a distance and see what a scumbag he was. Okay? All right. More questions? Yep, right there. How old was I when I started trying to get published? I was actually 38. I was the CEO of an internet company. I'd never written a book. I'd never gone to a writer's conference. I'd taken a couple of high school creative writing classes. I hadn't even graduated from high school. And I was in a really stressful time and started writing this story while I was on flights flying around all across the country as a way to relax. And I got done and everyone was like, wow, this is really good. You know, what, what are you going to do with it? Where is it going to get published? And I had no clue. Okay. So that is to tell you, I've got a friend who published his first book, book when he was in his 60s. I've got another friend who published his first book when he was 14. What Shannon Hale said is great, is just write your very best work, and when you get published, that's the time that's right for you. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much for letting me present to you guys today. You guys were awesome. Thank you.